Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the TED Climate Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Cortler. Our modern lives are filled with so many things. Just looking at my desk, I've got a water bottle, my phone, this computer, papers, books, this microphone, um, my cat. I guess my cat's not really a thing, but he's here. Not to mention the clothes that I'm wearing, the chair I'm sitting in, the rug under my feet. And that's just in the two-foot radius around me. Manufactured goods are so ubiquitous that we often don't think twice about how they're made or where they come from. And sorry to break this to you, but that process, it's not usually, like, amazing for the planet. Still, learning how these things are made is an important step to changing our habits and, hopefully, implementing more sustainable practices. So, let's get into it. Consider the classic white t-shirt. Every year, we buy 2 billion t-shirts globally, making it one of the most common garments in the world. The production of clothing items can vary a lot, but a typical t-shirt begins life on a farm in America, China, or India, where cotton seeds are sown, irrigated, and grown for the fluffy bowls they produce. Cotton plants require a huge amount of water, like a crazy amount of water. 2,700 liters are needed to produce the average t-shirt. That's enough to fill more than 30 bathtubs. And again, that's just one shirt. Meanwhile, cotton uses more insecticides and pesticides than any other crop in the world. These pollutants can be carcinogenic, harm the health of field workers, and damage surrounding ecosystems. Some t-shirts are made of organic cotton grown without pesticides and insecticides, but that's less than 1% of the 22.7 million metric tons of cotton produced worldwide. Once the cotton bales leave the farm, textile mills ship them to a spinning factory, usually in China or India. Here, high-tech machines blend, card, comb, pull, stretch, and finally twist the cotton into ropes of yarn called slivers. These slivers are then sent to the mill, where huge circular knitting machines weave them into sheets of rough grayish fabric, treated with heat and chemicals until they turn soft and white. Here, the fabric is dipped into commercial bleaches and azo dyes, which make up the vivid coloring in about 70% of textiles. But as you may be guessed, these chemicals aren't so great either. Some of them contain cancer-causing cadmium, lead, chromium, and mercury. Other harmful compounds and chemicals can cause widespread contamination when released as toxic wastewater in rivers and oceans. In some countries, technologies are now so advanced that the entire process that we've talked about growing, producing fabric is all largely automated, at least up to this point. After the finished cloth travels to factories, often in Bangladesh, China, India, or Turkey, human labor is still required to stitch them up into t-shirts, intricate work that machines just can't do. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this process has its own problems. Bangladesh, for example, which has surpassed China as the world's biggest exporter of cotton t-shirts, employs 4.5 million people in the t-shirt industry, typically facing poor conditions and low wages. After manufacture, all those t-shirts travel by ship, train, and truck to be sold in high-income countries. This part of the process creates a lot of carbon pollution. Some countries produce their own clothing domestically, which cuts out this polluting stage, but generally, apparel production accounts for 10% of global carbon emissions. And this number's only getting bigger. I mean, cheaper clothes and our rampant desire to buy new things, put them on our bodies, show them off, turn heads at the club. These have boosted global production from 1994 to 2014 by 400%. These days, we're turning out roughly 80 billion garments a year. But even after you take it home, that t-shirt goes through one of the most resource-intensive phases of its lifetime. That's right. It's laundry. In America, for instance, the average household does nearly 400 loads of laundry a year, each using about 40 gallons of water. And washing machines and dryers both use energy. Dryers use five to six times more than washers. This dramatic shift in clothing consumption over the last two decades, driven by large corporations and the trends of fast fashion, has cost the environment and the health of farmers. It's also driven frequently horrifying human labor practices and turned fashion into the second largest polluter in the world behind oil. As is probably abundantly clear at this point, this is a systemic problem. There are many complex systems in play when it comes to producing your favorite shirt, and important changes are going to need to happen from the top down. But there are some things we can do as individuals. Consider shopping secondhand. You know, try to look for textiles made from recycled or organic fabrics. You can wash your clothes less. You know, use cold water and line dry to save resources. Instead of throwing them away at the end of their life, donate, recycle, or reuse your clothes as cleaning rags. And 
The next time you're going shopping, ask yourself, how many shirts are you going to own over your lifetime? And what does that mountain of shirts impact on the world actually look like? Here's a hot tip. If your clothes don't smell after a day of wearing them, just put them back in your dresser and wear them again. Nobody needs to know. I've been doing this for weeks, and none of my coworkers working miles away from me have complained. Anyways, it's absolutely insane how many resources it takes to make and maintain a single t-shirt. But sadly, it's a pretty common story for most of the items we own. Like that thing you're probably using to listen to this podcast, your smartphone. In 2018, there were roughly 2.5 billion smartphone users in the world, and that number has only gone up since. But if we broke open all those phones, which again, are just a fraction of the total phones that have been built, and split them into their component parts, we'd end up with roughly 85,000 kilograms of gold, 875,000 of silver, and 40 million kilograms of copper. How did this treasure trove get into our phones? I'm like, can I get it back? Gold, silver, and copper are actually just a few of the 70 or so chemical elements that make up the average smartphone. And they can be divided into different groups, two of the most critical being rare earth elements and precious metals. Rare earths are a selection of 17 elements that are actually common in the Earth's crust and are found in many areas around the world in low concentrations. These elements have a huge range of magnetic, phosphorescent, and conductive properties that make them crucial to modern technology. In smartphones, they create the screen and the color display, they aid conductivity, and they produce the signature vibrations, among other things. And yet, crucial as they are, extracting these elements from the Earth is linked to some disturbing environmental impacts. Are you picking up on the theme here? Since they exist in low concentrations in many areas, it's often not economically feasible to just extract rare earth elements. And a lot of the time, extracting them requires a method called open pit mining that exposes vast areas of land. This destroys huge swaths of natural habitats and causes air and water pollution, which threatens the health of nearby human communities. Another group of ingredients in smartphones comes with similar environmental risks. I'm talking about metals like copper, silver, palladium, aluminum, platinum, tungsten, tin, lead, and gold. We also mine magnesium, lithium, silica, and potassium to make phones. And every single one of them is associated with vast habitat destruction, as well as air and water pollution. (sighs) Mining comes with worrying social problems, too, like large-scale human and animal displacement to make way for industrial operations. And frequently, as with fast fashion, poor working conditions for laborers. Lastly, phone production also requires petroleum, one of the main drivers of climate change. That entwines our smartphones inextricably with the growing planetary crisis. What's more, the ingredients we mine to make our phones aren't infinite. One day they're simply going to run out, and we have not yet discovered effective replacements for some. This means that reclaiming the bounty within our phones is swiftly becoming a necessity, So if you have an old phone, don't just throw it away. (laughs) To minimize waste, you should donate it to a charity for reuse or take it to an e-waste recycling facility or look for a company that refurbishes old models. But even recycling companies need our scrutiny. Just as the production of smartphones comes with social and environmental problems, dismantling them does too. E-waste is sometimes intentionally exported to countries where labor is cheap and working conditions are poor. Vast workforces, often made up of women and children, may be underpaid, lack the training to safely disassemble phones, and be exposed to elements like lead and mercury, which can permanently damage their nervous systems. Phone waste can also end up in huge dump sites, leaching toxic chemicals into the soil and water, mirroring the problems of the mines where the elements originated. A phone is so much more than it appears to be on the surface. It's an assemblage of elements from multiple countries linked to impacts that are unfolding on the global scale. So until someone invents a completely sustainable smartphone, we're going to need to come to terms with how this technology actually affects the world. (sighs) Okay, gang, this was admittedly a tough one. I'm having a bit of a crisis about how many things I own and what their existence has done to the planet. Also feeling kind of helpless because a lot of this stuff feels out of my control. But, but, 
I still honestly think that it is better to know how our stuff is made so we can at least try to make smarter choices. I think the lessons here are similar to what we talked about with plastic, right? Like, do your research, uh, buy from sustainable ethical sources, buy less, like way less, use and reuse as much as possible, and really consider where your stuff goes when you're done with it. With fashion and with smartphones, it's a battle between sustainability and keeping up with trends. So before you go out to buy the latest iPhone or that admittedly perfect jacket that Instagram advertised to you, ask yourself, do I actually need this? Thanks for tuning in. More next week on how we can change climate change. You can also get involved by joining Countdown, TED's global initiative to accelerate solutions to the climate crisis in collaboration with future stewards. Find out more at countdown.ted.com. And for a peek into another common item we own, check out the TED Ed lesson, The Wildly Complex Anatomy of a Sneaker by Angel Chang. Sneakers are crazy, y'all. TED Climate is produced and edited by Sheena Ozaki, mixed by Sam Baer, and hosted by me, Dan Cortler. This episode adapted two lessons originally produced in animated form by the TED Ed team. The Life Cycle of a T-Shirt was written by Angel Chang, and What's in Your Smartphone was written by Kim Preshoff. Both pieces were produced with editorial support from Emma Bryce and Alex Rosenthal and fact-checked by Francisco Diaz. So special thanks to them and to Gertigello, Michelle Quint, Ben Ben Chang, and Anna Phelan.